I am, this is my first year participating in this event and I learned a lot about this foundation. So I'm uh, very thankful to be at least in a small way part of this group that really contributes to a very worthy cause. Um, as um, uh, Shalinder mentioned, I am an associate professor at the University of Washington. I focus on head and neck malignancies. Okay, um, as a clinical researcher, I receive institutional research funding and I have also served um, in an advisory capacity for a small biopharma company. I happen to also be married to another clinical researcher and I have to list his uh, grant support and advisory um, board uh, responsibilities as well. Okay, so um, today I'm tasked to give um, an overview of some of the abstracts presented at our most recent ASCO 2020 meeting. And I chose four of, of these abstracts that either have um, practice changing or close to practice changing consequences, and those are listed here. And I'll try to go over all of this in the next 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to get an interactive um, sort of poll question from the audience. This is not a right or wrong answer type poll. This is simply to kind of get a gauge of what the, private, the practice patterns are among the, patient, the folks who are participating in this call. So that um, Samantha will help me with this. Okay, so let's move on and start with the first abstract. This is abstract um, 6500. This is also called the ECOG 3311 trial. This is a um, randomized trial of upfront transoral robotic surgical resection in patients with resectable P16 positive locally advanced oropharynx cancer. Um, I'm very proud to say that as a site, we participated in this and my deceased colleague, um, Eduardo Mendez, who died two years ago, was really an ardent supporter of this trial. Um, and we're very happy to um, see this kind of come to fruition. Before I talk about this trial, let's see. Um, find out what, how this um, group treats these patients. Okay. Um, a 56-year-old male sees you after a successful robotic resection of an AJCC version 8 T1N1 P16 positive left base of tongue, squame. He's a never smoker. He's healthy. He has a 0.7 centimeter primary site, negative margins, four involved lymph nodes with extracapsular extension. What would you recommend? Observation, postoperative radiation, postoperative radiation with chemo or PEMBRO? Okay, do we have the results, Samantha? Okay, so most patients would, most individuals would choose option C. So let's talk about the background behind this study. Um, we know that the HPV related oropharynx cohort is rising in incidence, that these patients are both demographically and prognostically distinct to the P16 negative counterparts. And despite an overall superior prognosis, tobacco use alters the, um, the um, outcome for these P16 positive oropharynx squamous cell cancers. Because of this, de-escalation for the best risk P16 positive oropharynx cancer has been an intuitive direction of scientific research in this area. Most recently, in the definitive concurrent chemoradiation setting, the clinical trials RTOG 1016 and Deescalate actually showed that cisplatin and radiation were superior to uh, cetuximab based radiation. When we talk about non radiation based therapies, transoral robotic resection has emerged as a very viable option for the P16 positive cohort because of a general small size of their primary tumors and low burden of nodal disease. However, the therapeutic advantage over doing this over definitive radiation is unknown. Um, one advantage is that it provides the ability to pathologically evaluate the resected disease. Now, much of what we do in the postoperative setting for the P16 positive population was generated in the pre HPV era. The jointly published RTOG 9501 and the EORTC 22931 studies showed superiority of postoperative cisplatin radiation in patients with high risk features. 
but there's concern for the significant increase in acute and late toxicity of these approaches for these patients. Furthermore, we don't really know how these traditional risk factors impact outcome for the HPV positive or pharynx cancer cohort. The data here is not prospective. There's conflicting results among retrospective data sets. And at least in the most recent AJCC version eight staging, um, it seems like it's more of the number of lymph nodes rather than the presence of extracapsular extension that appears to be prognostic for this population. And so ECOG 3311 sought to answer some questions um, about um, the role of transoral resection in this population. It took a population of um, good risk, low stage, uh, meaning small T's, limited N, P16 positive um, patients. And it's a little bit of a confusing um, clinical trial schema, but these patients are assigned to treatment arms based on pathologic um, evaluation. Patients without nodal involvement with a small T and negative margins were observed. Those that had high risk, which were defined as positive margins, um, extensive extra, uh, extra nodal extension or five or greater lymph nodes were actually assigned to a treatment that somewhat recapitulates what we do in the standard setting, which is give them chemo radiation. The research question really lies in these two arms, arms B and C, where patients with intermediate risk factors, less than one millimeter extra nodal extension or two to four lymph nodes, were randomized to two different radiation schedules with no chemotherapy given. Um, the low dose um, radiation arm received 50 gray. The primary endpoint of this was um, one fe feasibility, but the other was to examine the progression-free survival in these two arms that required randomization to see if there would be a progression-free survival signal in the de-escalated radiation dose worthy of further study. Um, the accrual goal was uh, 515 patients, primarily geared towards having a sample size of 180 patients in arms B and C that would lead to the evaluation of the primary endpoint. So what did they find? First of all, this trial ran over four years and it required 82 credentialed surgeons. Um, in other words, you had to show that you had extensive um, experience with TORS resection in order to qualify for this, um, this study. Um, Post-operative management was determined by pathologically assessed risk. And in this um, trial, approximately 60% of the patients were randomized between arms B and C. Only 11% had very low risk disease, and about a third of the patients ended up being shunted towards the high-risk arm. For the patients who were um, uh, assigned to the high-risk arm, the majority of them did so because they had extra nodal extension. The rates of um, positive margins were actually pretty low. It's very interesting, and one of the um, kind of points about this study is there was a very large screen fail rate in this trial. 80% of patients who, were, um, who signed consent ended up not being eligible, 15% of them. And the, um, uh, the primary investigator just uh, showed a, this, a set of um, reasons why this was the case. But interestingly enough, these are the results, and these are two-year progression-free survival results for each of the arms. As you can see, even the arm with the highest risk did very well. There were two treatment-related deaths, um, and the primary endpoint of this study was met, where arm B um, was, was met the upper bound of the 90% confidence interval. It, it, it exceeded 85%. So um, this study concluded that not only uh, is um, PC, uh, transoral resection upfront feasible and safe, but it, it has a very, very encouraging two-year um, progression-free survival outcome. Um, and I think the authors were very appropriately cautious in saying that transoral surgery followed by low-dose radiation therapy in patients with intermediate risk factors should be compared to optimal non-surgical therapy in a phase three trial. So let's talk in the next few slides about what the implications of this study are. Number one, 
This study is the first land randomized large phase two trial for upfront surgery in this particular disease, um, in disease group. Uh, it's, very, it's key that the surgeons who participated in this study uh, were all from high volume centers and with extensive expertise in the use of transoral robotic surgery. I think I will have to emphasize that these oncologic outcomes, these two year PFS encouraging results are early. We know that this is a good prognosis pa uh, patient population, but recurrences can occur late in this population. Uh, we also saw that perioperative mortality was low in the hands of experts who do this all the time. Um, a few things to note, a significant proportion of these patients were not randomized, enrolled but not randomized. And in this high volume, high expertise group, a third of our patients who we think are low risk actually end up still needing about uh, trimodality therapy. Before this trial, there was already a, a significant provocative data on the debate between whether we should be operating on these patients versus treating them with concurrent chemoradiation. Specifically, a large NCDB-based retrospective but registry-based data set was published in 2018, looking at national trends in patients treated with surgery between the years 2010 and 2013. There's about 1,500 of these patients. It, at least in this group, about two-thirds of patients who went, underwent upfront surgery ended up receiving trimodality therapy, in other words, needing chemotherapy and radiation in the adjuvant setting, with a very similar overall survival to the chemoradiation treated population. There are also smaller prospective studies, such as that from the Mayo Clinic of 80 patients treated with adjuvant aggressively de-escalated radiation, 30 to 36 gray and weekly docetaxel, with a local regional control um, rate of 96% at 36 month median follow-up, again, early. There was also a small Canadian randomized phase two, uh, phase two trial called Orator of 68 patients treated with either torso radiation with no clinically significant difference in quality of life. This is by no means the only study that will be looking at upfront surgical resection. I um, listed four large trials looking at um, trying to answer how we integrate TORS into our treatment of this um, uh, population. The only real randomized trial between uh, radiation and chemo, uh, and chemo radiation versus TORS is the ORATOR2 study, which is being carried out in Canada. I will say that there is provocative de-escalation data too in the definitive radiation um, arena. And this was presented by Su Yom at one of our ASTRO meetings um, a year, I think one or two years ago. This is NRG8, uh, HN002, which was a trial um, in patients with, again, a good risk squamous cell carcinomas, P16 positive only, randomized to cisplatin radiation um, versus um, uh, radiation alone. And as you can see in this particular clinical trial, the progression-free survival for um, definitive radiation de-escalated to 60 gray with chemotherapy was the winning arm of this phase two trial. And it is in fact um, being studied in the follow-up HN005 trial. Uh, which is a concurrent de-escalation chemoradiation uh, versus immunotherapy in de-escalated radiation study in the P16 positive setting. We also have data from ECOG suggesting that chemo-selected patients who respond beautifully to chemotherapy have an excellent two-year progression-free survival with 54 gray of definitive radiation. So lots of um, data out there suggesting that Maybe these outcomes would be similar if we, uh, in the, both the surgically treated or the radiation treated population. Not to mention that there is a lot of questions surrounding what immunotherapy might add to how, well, uh, to how we treat the HPV positive population. Here are at least five, uh, four randomized clinical trials asking the question, does um, the addition of um, immunotherapy to radiation-based treatment improve outcomes? And all of these studies include patients with P16 positive disease. So um, what is my take from this um, uh, abstract? I think it's 
very encouraging, the early but early PFS signal um, among patients with intermediate risk factors. I think it would be very important to look at the long-term oncologic and functional outcome of this patient population. And I think even though this is already kind of a an accepted approach, I think it is very important to compare this approach to de-escalated definitive radiation therapy, uh, data that we don't have yet, but hopefully will be forthcoming. Okay, next abstract. Um, this is um, 6502, a phase three trial of postoperative chemoradiotherapy comparing th th uh, three weekly versus weekly cisplatin also called JCOG1008. So let's get a poll question. If you have a patient who has positive margins or positive extracapsular extension after surgical resection, but no contraindication to cisplatin administration, well, how would you treat this patient? A, with cisplatin 100 milligram per meter squared on days 122 and 43 radiation, 40 milligram per meter squared weekly during radiation, 30 milligram weekly during radiation, or none of the above. Okay, most people chose um, option A. All right, so um, postoperative radiation is an established standard for patients who have high risk features after surgery. And as I mentioned before, two large randomized trials support this approach, and both trials used cisplatin given as a bolus on days 122 and 43. We don't have a lot of data on weekly cisplatin here. Although its use is really quite prevalent in the US, um, there's conflicting observational studies. And I think there's just an empiric sort of feeling that giving weekly cisplatin is a lot easier to tolerate for our patients. So JCOG1008 sought to try to answer this question and it took patients um, uh, mostly in multiple um, sites in Japan with the traditional high-risk features of um, positive margins um, or extranodal extension. It enrolled patients with oral cavity larynx, oropharynx, and hypopharynx cancers and randomized them to either the traditional weekly, sorry, the traditional bolus administration versus the weekly administration at 40 milligram per meter squared. I'd like to point out that there were the stratification factors were the um, high-risk features and the institution and this study did not stratify based on stage, a key point which we'll, point, uh, we'll go over later. This was a non-inferiority um, uh, trial, and the target sample was 260 patients. This completed accrual, but the interim analysis met pre-specified stopping criteria and early reporting of results. Um, when we look at this um, patient distribution, we'll see that in both arms, the age, the sex, and the performance status were well balanced. However, when we start looking at the primary sites and the T and N stage, there seems to be a preponderance of higher risk T3 and 4 and N3s in the bolus cisplatin arm. And um, although both of these populations not unexpectedly had oral cavity primaries, um, subsets where we generally do surgery first, there is a preponderance of um, hypopharynx patients, which we know um, have poor prognosis, and a higher rate of oropharynx patients in the weekly cisplatin arm. Many of these, as I mentioned before, may be P16 positive. Um, what we also saw was, at least in Japan, they have an excellent chemotherapy and radiation compliance where, where, where most of the patients received all the planned doses of chemotherapy, either in the bolus or weekly arm. This is very different from prior clinical trial rates of completion of bolus cisplatin, which ranges anywhere from 30 to 60%. Interestingly enough, when you look at the patients who received the chemotherapy and bolus, they had a much higher cumulative dose of cisplatin compared to the weekly arm. And not unexpectedly, 
Um, acute hematologic toxicities were um, somewhat different among the two arms, with the um, weekly arm having a less um, rate of neutropenia and a slightly um, lower rate of uh, thrombocytopenia, low grade in the bolus arm. If you look at the non-hematologic toxicities, especially the grade three or four toxicities, there seemed to be an advantage from a dysphagia, nausea, and infection standpoint compared to the bolus cisplatin arm. There were also some differences in the low-grade um, uh, uh, toxicities favoring the weekly cisplatin uh, administration. And interestingly enough, this was not a non-inferiority study. Um, although both overall survival and relapse-free survival were felt to be non-inferior in the weekly cisplatin arm, there is a numerical and not statistically, uh, there's a numerical advantage of the overall survival and local relapse survival for patients who, had, uh, who were um, enrolled in the weekly arm. So let's talk about these results. Um, first of all, before this study, this is essentially, I had listed down the three largest randomized um, experiences between weekly and bolus cisplatin. One came from India, the Tata Memorial Hospital, where they randomized patients also mostly in the adjuvant setting to a lower weekly dose of um, cisplatin, sorry, that's meter squared, my apologies, versus bolus. And they showed that with bolus cisplatin, there was improved local regional control offset by worse toxicity. There are two other studies, but these were in nasopharyngeal carcinoma, comparing weekly 40 milligram per meter bol uh, versus bolus, showing really no difference in, um, in outcomes and some differences in toxicity, mostly uh, hematologic. This particular trial provides us evidence that weekly cisplatin is not inferior to bolus in the adjuvant setting. And it's less clear why, with higher cumulative doses of cisplatin delivered in the bolus arm, they saw what appeared to be an advantage in overall survival and local regional control. My thought is this is probably related to some imbalance in the T and N distribution, which was not stratified for at randomization. And there could be an overrepresentation of good prognosis groups in the weekly cisplatin arm inadvertently. It appears that at least for high grade neutropenia dysphagia and nausea, the weekly cisplatin is more advantageous. And um, sit tight because a large, tri um, larger trial in the definitive setting is being planned by the NRG. Okay, moving on, there's two more abstracts, but these are shorter presentations. So my apologies to Shalinder for um, impinging on his time. Um, I will try to quickly go over this. So this is abstract 6503, which is excitinib in recurrent metastatic adenoid cystic carcinoma. Let's get a quick poll of um, how many of you treat these patients. Have you seen a patient with adenoid cystic carcinoma? No. Have you managed one to two cases, five to 10, or do you see these patients regularly? Okay, a few. So most people see one to two cases, excellent. Okay, so um, adenoid cystic carcinoma is a very uncommon disease. It's one of the 20 plus WHO 2017 subsets of salivary gland cancers. These um, are cancers with a generally indolent biology, but that biology may be altered by the percentage of solid component of the tumor of the presence of a mutation uh, in notch. Many of these cancers furthermore overexpress CKIT, VEGF, or carry MIB mutations. There has um, been a very disappointing experience with um, any type of targeted therapy or cytotoxic therapy uh, for that matter for adenoid cystic carcinoma. And I listed a few of these trials here. As you can see, there's a number of um, targeted agents that have been tested, all of which show essentially no responses um, in this population, the predominant of, uh, predominance of stable disease as the best outcome uh, seen, which is hard to differentiate between the uh, natural um, biology of the cancer. The drug lenvatinib seems to have a partial response rate of 
The, this study was carried out in various centers uh, in Korea and it enrolled patients with recurrent metastatic adenoid cystic carcinoma, specifically those who had progressing disease. They randomized patients between excitinib or observation with progression, with um, crossover permitted at progression. The primary endpoint was six months PFS and the N uh, sample size was 60. Um, I am listing the um, tumor characteristics here. They're generally well balanced, although I will point out that more patients in the observation arm seem to have um, distant metastasis. And the patients in the, um, in the uh, observation arm also appear to be more heavily pretreated than the excitinib arm. And not surprisingly, there was also no um, uh, objective responses seen in the patients um, uh, assigned to excitinib, but the crossover there were three who were found to have um, uh, responses uh, uh, with an 11% uh, objective response rate. Uh, with that though, there was a progression-free survival um, benefit to um, the initiation of exitinib, but no difference in overall survival, not surprisingly as well. We, I think it's important to realize that many of these VEGF inhibitors really their, their um, toxicity uh, profile is uh, non-trivial with um, many patients experiencing stomatitis, hypertension, hand foot syndrome, and diarrhea. So um, I think what the, my takeaway from this um, uh, abstract was that number one, I have to commend the, the investigators. This is the first randomized study in this disease population. And they appropriately enriched for patients with progressing disease, important for, patient, for diseases with indolent biology. This can still be a heterogeneous population, but at least it's a one way that we can try to limit it to patients who need therapy. The PFS was significant, but I also am cautiously, uh, um, uh, we have to be cautious in looking at this data because this was a non-blinded, non-placebo, uh, this is a non-blinded -bl um, design, sorry, it's placebo controlled. Um, and the resist responses were also not independently evaluated. Uh, I will add that the toxicity is non-trivial in a population that is usually minimally symptomatic, something that we have to remember when we're trying to decide when to treat these patients. But this also tells us that randomized clinical trials are feasible for this population and for rare diseases for that matter. Okay, this is my last abstract, um, abstract 6504, which talks about the activity of a drug called tipifarnib in tumors of the head and neck and salivary gland. So quickly, um, which statement best describes how you use next generation sequencing in your head and neck squamous cell carcinoma patients? I order it for all patients. I order it for recurrent metastatic disease only. I, I order it rarely or I never order this. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's talk about um, the background. In head and neck squamous cell carcinomas, we really don't have a wealth of novel targeted agents in our treatment ar armamentarium. In fact, the only targeted therapy approved is actually cetuximab, and there is not even a biomarker that predicts for the response. HRAS mutation seems to occur in about 5% of patients with head and neck cancer and approximately 20% of patients with salivary gland cancer. And in, this drug is believed to work, um, this drug tipifarnib, because it is a farnesyl transferase inhibitor. Farnesyl transferase is necessary in order for HRAS to affect downstream signaling, and tipifarnib inhibits um, this enzyme. This um, abstract was the result of a basket um, trial, really, uh, that um, in, uh, enrolled solid tumors that harbored an HRAS mutation. And we're going to be talking today about those patients enrolled in the head and neck squamous cell carcinoma and the salivary gland cohorts. Those um, with head and neck squamous cell carcinomas, there were 21 patients enrolled and 81, uh, sorry, 18 um, evaluable for toxicity. The majority of these patients were oral cavity squamous cell carcinomas 
heavily pretreated, and mostly HPV negative. As you can see, in the population that was um, evaluable, there was a 50% overall response rate. Again, small population, but it appears that half of them responded to tipifarvib. When we look at the salivary gland cohort, there were 12 patients involved. Uh, the majority were salivary duct and myoepithelial carcinoma, but the response rates were not as encouraging with only one, um, with really only one patient responding and mostly stable disease being observed. So I think briefly, this uh, abstract represents that there is encouraging efficacy of molecularly driven therapy, and that could be a very feasible avenue for treating our patients, especially the head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. The toxicity was not well described in this paper, but there's been previously reported. Um, and these toxicities are mostly hematologic, GI, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and renal. There is evidence that these targeted approaches may be beneficial for head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, but this really represents a benefit for a very small subset of patients. And thank you so much. I appreciate your patience for my technical difficulties. Um, I have listed my email here. This is the end of my talk. Please feel free to reach out to me and email me if you have any questions.